over 25 years, well, actually, almost 30 years ago now, when I was a freshman in college. Wow, just saying that. <laughs> 29, let's just leave it there. Uh, at Wheaton College, I had to take a, an Old Testament survey class. Now, at that time, I was not the, uh, you know, the mature spiritual man you see before you. I was a bit of a, <laughs> I was uh, pretty rough around the edges. I was a relatively brand new believer in Jesus Christ, and I had zero Bible background or training. So I was uh, kind of intimidated to be at Wheaton among all of these students, and spiritually speaking especially. So I had to take this class called Old Testament Survey. My professor was a man named C. Hassel Bullock. Some of you may know Hassel Bullock. He, if you could close your eyes and envision what would an Old Testament prof look like, you probably have him in your mind. He talked with the, that voice, you know. One time he said in a class, <clears throat> it is not incumbent upon the listener to have the spiritual gift of listening. I went, huh? <laughs> I was doing that a lot in that class. Anyway, um, I was assigned a topic for a 10-page paper, and I had never written more than two pages in my life. You, you might, I, I'm going to confess to you a little, something here. When I was a high school student, I got, I got over a 30 on my ACT, a 32 on my ACT, but I was a C-minus average student. I was your classic underachiever. I just read the chapter summaries and got by and stayed eligible for football and wrestling. That's what I did when I was in high school. I had a lot of growing up to do. Went to Wheaton, and you can't do that. You can't get by. So I was struggling, and I was assigned a paper. I'd never written more than two pages. And it was 10 pages seemed insurmountable to me. And the topic I was assigned was... Wisdom personified as a woman in Proverbs. What? <laughs> I was 18 years old. I thought, that is crazy. I remember thinking vividly, how, why would I possibly need to know this ever? I was, a, I was an exercise science major. That's a fancy name for PE. I was, I was a phys ed major. I, I, I'm like, why would I need to know this ever? What possible reason could I have to know this? Now, I did write that paper, and you know, I still have it somewhere. I should go find it. On the, on the last page of that paper, Hassel Bullock, my professor, wrote these words. No grade, these words in red pen. Jeffrey, with unusually wide margins and an exceptionally large font, your paper still fails to meet the minimum requirement for length. Please try again. <laughs> I did try again, and I got a C. All right. When, when you come to Hebrews chapter 7, and you read through Hebrews chapter 7, I think for many of us, you read about this guy Melchizedek, and you are tempted to think, what possible reason could I have to know about this? Why do I need to know this? How is this relevant for my life, this strange, mysterious, ancient priest who shows up in this book of the Bible? Seriously. Who is this guy, and why do we need to know about him? Well, in John's gospel, he said, if all that Jesus said and did were to be written down, there would not be enough books in the libraries of the world to contain it all. So I think we can infer from that that God gave us a relatively small sample size of what he could have given us in his word. Meaning, he didn't just need to fill space like I did with a 10-page paper. Let's put some more stuff in there. Everything in here is for a reason, for our benefit. So even if it's difficult to understand because we're removed from that culture from many centuries, there's a reason God gives it to us. And I hope that we'll discover that reason together this morning as we go. If you have your Bible open to Hebrews chapter 7, we'll read the first three verses. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first, by a translation of his name, a king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. It goes on, but we'll stop right there. Melchizedek, as referenced here, first shows up in Genesis chapter 14. The writer of Hebrews uh, refers to this briefly. Abraham, in Genesis 14, Father Abraham, is on his way back home after a pretty remarkable military conquest. You might think of Abraham as just a quiet shepherd guy in the tents. He actually was a warlord, a chieftain of sorts. He has just defeated four foreign kings and rescued his nephew Lot and his family and is returning home with the spoils of war and those that he rescued. 
He is at the height of his power and influence in the ancient world. He's a pretty powerful figure. And on his way home, out of nowhere, this guy, Melchizedek, shows up while they're camped. Comes to him and brings, Genesis 14, verse 18 says, bread and wine. Hmm. And then Abraham gives to Melchizedek a tenth of all that he had. A tithe, a form of worship, as it were. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham. In the Old Testament, the greater always blesses the lesser, who's greater than Father Abraham at that time. The Jews would have said God alone. He blesses him and then disappears, and we don't hear another word about him for a thousand years. Not a word, not a mention of his name for a thousand years until Psalm 110, verse 4, King David mentions him in one verse, a messianic psalm, a messianic section of Psalm 110, when he says that God will not relent, he has decreed your priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Then another thousand years go by without a single reference to his name until you come to Hebrews chapter chapter 5, 6, and 7. And then repeatedly, This guy, his name comes up over and over again in the book of Hebrews. Suddenly, the New Testament writer of Hebrews wants to say something to us, and apparently he thinks that Melchizedek is the way to communicate it. Why? Well, we're given a few clues if you paid attention to that reading and if you have read the Old Testament. First, his name. His name means king of righteousness. Second, his title. He was called King of Salem, which is the transliteration of the Hebrew word Shalom, peace, King of Peace. So his name, King of Righteousness, his title, King of Peace. Third, his role. He is priest of God Most High. Fourth, his genealogy. He didn't have one. Every other major figure in the Old Testament, you read they're the son of so-and-so. They're, 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 you read about their ancestors, where they came from. That was the Hebrew way of describing to you why you should listen to this person. Melchizedek shows up, and they make a point of saying he didn't have mother and father, nor beginning of days, nor end of life. What? Who is this guy? His name, king of righteousness. His title, king of peace. His role, priest of God most high. His genealogy, apparently didn't have one. This is a pretty unusual figure. Hmm. King of righteousness, king of peace, sent from God most high without beginning or end of days. That's not familiar at all. Now, now scholars debate whether or not this is an actual, what they call theophany, or an actual appearance of the second person of the Trinity. If you think you're in theology class right now, let me explain. Scholars debate, is this actually Jesus showing up before the incarnation in the Old Testament? Or is it just a type of Christ to meant to point us to him? It's one or the other, clearly. Either way, the thing the writer of Hebrews wants us to see is that even in the Old Testament, even back, way back in the days of Father Abraham, the priesthood and the Levitical law and the Old Covenant were never meant to be permanent. They were always meant to point us to something and someone who was better, who was greater. This is the first thing we see here, a better high priest. Now we've already discussed this in detail uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Sermon on Hebrews chapter 4, that he's our great high priest. But in the Jewish mind, without a priest, you could not a- offer sacrifices. Without sacrifices, you could not have forgiveness of sin. So it's not surprising that the Jewish mind fixed a lot of importance and dependence on the priesthood. And here comes this stranger called Priest of God Most High. The author's been aiming at this unfolding reality since the, of the priesthood since Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7. And by connecting Jesus to Melchizedek, he's saying that Jesus is an entirely different kind of priest than they were used to in the old system. First, Jesus is not a Levite, meaning he's not from the tribe of Levi. Who knows what tribe Jesus is from? Judah, he's the Lion of Judah. Now, 
so you understand what this means, in the Old Testament, you could not sign up to be a priest. You could decide. You could feel the call of God to be a pastor, go to seminary, and then in, and apply and be hired and become a pastor in today's culture. Regardless of your family of, of origin, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter today. In the Old Testament, you couldn't sign up to be a priest. You couldn't decide, I feel like I should be a priest. You had to be born into that family, into that tribe, the, the descendants of Aaron and Levi, the tribe of Levi, the Levites. And then you had to be selected out of that tribe. Physical defects, you were, you were inspected physically. How'd you like that? I'm so glad they didn't do that in seminary. Stand me up there, strip me down, and inspect you for physical defects, you know? But the priests had to be inspected physically. They couldn't, they could, certain defects weren't allowed. And they were, the best of the best were selected to serve as priests. Out of that tribe, out of that family, Select, chosen by men to serve as priests. Jesus is not from that tribe, meaning according to the law itself, he could not be a priest. Melchizedek is not named as if from the tribe of Levi. He has no genealogy. Second, outside of Jesus and Melchizedek, nobody else in all the Bible has the role of priest and king. No one. In fact, all the Old Testament, it's very clear. God makes a clear distinction and separation between priests and kings. And the two men who were kings who tried to operate as priests also, it did not go very well for them. Perhaps you remember the story of Saul offering sacrifices and what happened to him. Or Uzziah, a lesser known figure, but certainly he ended up leprous because he entered the temple and tried to be, perform the functions of a priest. In other words, there are kings and there are priests, but those are different roles ordained by God. Here comes this stranger, this mysterious figure, who's called king of righteousness, king of Salem, and priest of God most high. What does what, what Handel's Messiah say that we sing out of Isaiah every year at Christmas time? King of kings, right? Lord of lords. He is king, and he's our priest. Only Jesus is called this, nobody else. But why is this a better high priest necessary? What was wrong with the old system? Uh, verse 11 and 12 of, of Hebrews chapter 7. Now if the perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people re received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. It was never intended to be permanent. Did you hear what he said? If perfection could be attained by the old priesthood, you wouldn't need this new priest. And this, this strange phrase about when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. The law and the priesthood were inextricably linked. Levitical law, Levitical priesthood. The law required priests to be Levites, right? And the Levites carried out the, the legal requirements of the priestly role in the temple. When Jesus comes... He says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Meaning we're not changing the situation. It was all pointing to me anyway. And I don't come out of it. I stand above it and apart from it. The law and the priesthood were the backbone of Jewish society. These are, these are, these are not shocking statements to us. But they would have been to first century Jewish believers. Let me read verses 15 through 19 of chapter 7. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirements concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. He's saying, why would you, Jewish believers in Christ, go back or be tempted to go back to the old priesthood and to the old covenant? Because that was all, when, when you now possess in Christ what all of that was meant to bring you to, why go back to the shadow and the forms when you have the substance? Some of you may have read Plato when you were in school or maybe been forced to. Perhaps you remember it, perhaps you don't. Not Plato, the stuff you make, but Plato, the Greek philosopher. Maybe you remember his, his analogy of the cave. The shadows on a cave wall. And how those are the, the, those are the shadows 
uh, and there is a reality behind them. C.S. Lewis picks up this, and by the way, the movie The Shadowlands is based on his idea of this, that we tend to think of this life as the real life, and heaven is somehow shadowy and, and, and less real. But he says it's actually the reverse. We, this is, we are living in a less real world than the one that awaits us. And that's where we put our trust and our hope. And he also, so in other words, the, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, when you were under the old covenant, those things were good only insofar as they were shadows of what was to come. They were pointing you to the one who was, is to come. Why now that you have the reality, the substance, the object itself, Jesus Christ, would you go back to those shadows, to those forms? It makes no sense. And why would they be tempted to do that? If you've been with us in the series, you know that because those Jewish believers were facing persecution, hardship for their faith, many of them were beginning to wonder, is this whole Jesus thing worth it? Maybe we were better off under the old covenant. Maybe we should go back. Why would you go back? The qualifications for a high priest in the old covenant were all external. Your birth, your family, the examination of your body and your life. The qualifications for Jesus are all internal. What does John say in John chapter 1, verse 14? In him was life. In him was life. He's not pointing us to the life. He is the life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything prior is pointing to the life, the way, the truth, and the life, our high priest Jesus. The law itself was holy and good, but it was never designed to make people perfect. That word meaning complete, right with God. And then we read these words at the end of verse 19, a better hope a better hope for those who draw near to him. Last week we looked closely at this hope from verse 19 as the anchor for our souls. And this hope, as we said, is not, it's not, a, it's not a philosophy. It's, it's Jesus himself. The author of Hebrews likes this word better. It's the Greek word kraeton. It, it, it means better or greater. He uses it 12 times. Of the 18 times it's used in the New Testament, 12 of them are in Hebrews. And it's always in reference to Jesus. He's better. We've been looking at that. That's what's behind the title of our series. His point is, <clears throat> if you've got something better, why would you want something worse? Why would you go back? My kids, when they were little, we'd sometimes play this game, you know? Hannah, you could have one, you know, uh, what are those, uh, I forget the blow pops. They have gum inside them. She loved those things. And I think her teeth are paying for it now. But anyway, one blow pop now, or I'll give you 10, you know, 10 later if you clean up your room or whatever it was. When you're a little kid, it's hard to let go of the one, isn't it? I got this one now. Why would I want 10 later? I think in many ways, spiritually, we're like that. We're so fixated on what we think we need right now. <clears throat> we all go back, in other words, spiritually. These Jews are tempted to go back to what they had previously trusted for their salvation. What are you tempted to go back to in your heart? What formerly did you find your sense of significance or self-worth in or value in? What formerly did you depend on for your status and your, how you understood yourself to be? And you're tempted to go back there. For many years, it was achievement and accomplishment for me. Even as a, as, a, as a college athlete, and then after that, I went through that crisis which many athletes go through. You take it on faith now, but I used to play a little bit. I don't look like it, but I did back in those days. And you, you wonder, who am I now? Who am I without all this stuff propping me up? All the achievement, all the accolades, all the Jeff the All-American, Jeff the whatever. Is it enough to be Jeff the Son of God, Jeff the Child of God? Is that enough? Or do I need something else to make me feel okay about myself? When I finished my last college game, and then I tried to play briefly in the Arena Football League, when that was over, my old high school coach reached out to me, and he said, Jeffrey, you've now joined the largest fraternity in all of sports. Those who used to play. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you played 10 years in the NFL or stopped in eighth grade. We all used to play, right? It's over, in other words. Where's your identity now? And by identity, I mean your sense of who you are, that I'm okay, that I matter, that I'm significant. Is that in Christ? Is he enough as your great high priest? Or do you need something else to prop that up? Your success in business. The achievement of your children. Whatever it is. What are you tempted to go back to? Is he enough? I think that's at the heart of what we're being told here. 
for these Jewish believers, their whole frame of reference prior was, this system is how we know we're okay with God. But now we're told, Christ and Christ alone fulfills all that. I depend on him only. I think for all of us, that's a tension, isn't it? Even though you might feel like I'm so far removed from all this priest stuff in the Old Testament, all of us have a pull back to something, some other system that used to make us feel right with God. And we're being said, no, don't go back. You have him. And there's nothing greater. There's nothing better. That's why he's called a better hope. This phrase at the end of verse 19, for those who draw near, we talked about this idea a couple of weeks ago. You might remember, Pastor, the, the, the video of, of, of Evie Butler running to Pastor Bob Gray, her, her great-grandfather. That image of drawing near and coming in. And it, we'll come back to this idea in chapter 10 when he spends a whole bit of time on drawing near. But I think part of our struggle, part of our, the pull for us to go back to that which we used to depend on is because we don't access that which we have access to. Drawing near. Over and over again, the writer of Hebrews says, draw near, draw near to God. You have access. The door has been thrown open. The temple curtain has been torn. There's no barrier now between you and God. You don't depend on, depend on a human priest. You can go right into the Father. And to the degree that we do that, to the, deg- to the degree that you and I access that relationship, I think it's easier to trust Christ and him alone. But to the degree that we don't, I think we start drifting back into relying on these other things. We face problems and challenges in our lives and in our country, in our culture, in our world, for which knowing Christ more deeply is the only real answer. I'll say that again. We, we face real issues. And every day you... you, you, you t- turn on the news or you click, get on social media news feeds and it feels like there's more evidence of this all the time. There are real serious issues in our world which ultimately speaking it's the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the ultimate answer. Don't go back to rely on anything else other than him. Draw near. Access that relationship. Let me read to you verses 22 through 24. Of chapter 7. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. I love this phrase that Jesus is the guarantor. He's the guarantee. This, this phrase is only used a couple of times in the New Testament. But the guarantee. Jesus is the guarantee. Now admittedly in our culture, guarantees don't mean all that much at least in some cases. How many of you have ever actually received a money, your money back on a money-back guarantee? Some of you? How many of you tried it didn't work out? Anybody? How about been guaranteed a seat on a flight and found out that was not exactly ironclad? Or satisfaction guaranteed? I did a little research on this. Does that phrase actually mean anything? I did some legal research uh, looking into the law regarding retail and manufacturer guarantees, and they say satisfaction guaranteed. There's actually legal terminology. There's a difference between material claims for a company and what they call um, puffery. Actually, that's a word uh, used in a 1950s case that they still use today, P-U-F-F-E-R-Y, puffery. (laughs) I think that's hilarious. So material claims, like, in other words, for example, we are the lowest priced hot dogs in town. That's a material claim. And if you find out they're not, you could get yours lower, per, I suppose, or I don't know. But the claim, we're the best hot dogs in the world, that's puffery, right? It's subjective. How do you, who determines that? How do you know that? And they have all this legal code written about these things. Some of these are just meant to make you, ooh, the best in the world, or, the, or the, you know, whatever, satisfaction guaranteed. There's really nothing behind that. In fact, L.L. Bean uh, has a a slogan saying, our products are guaranteed to give 100% satisfaction in every way. Talk about absurd uh, claim. And in 1994, a California man attempted to sue L.L. Bean for $10 million, apparently solely on the grounds that he was not 100% satisfied in every way. He won the case, but not $10 million. This is why companies either make puffery claims, you know, they just say things that sound good, but there's nothing behind them. Or they're very, very careful in the fine print. But Jesus is called the guarantor. 
He's the guarantor of a better covenant. That's the next thing, a better covenant. Covenant is a Bible word, and some of you are familiar with that, and you've, you've studied this before, but for those of you that may not be, think of it this way. A covenant is simply a word describing your relationship with God. It's God's faithful promise to his people, and on those grounds, on that promise, is how you relate to him in the context of that covenant or that promise. The covenant of marriage. Stand before God, friends and family, and give my vows. My wife gives her vows. And our relationship is defined now by that covenant. That, that's, that's how we relate to each other, inside of that covenant. So when the Old Testament uses the word covenant, that's what it's talking about. The, way, the context in which God relates to his people and his re- people relate to him. So Jesus is called a guarantor. He's a guarantee of a better way of relating to God. Think of it that way. He's the better way that God communicates to his people and his people relate to him. To the Jewish mind, the phrase better covenant would have been almost unthinkable. What is better than God's promise to our father Abraham? What could be better than the Mosaic law given at Mount Sinai? That's the whole it thing. That's it. That's the backbone of our society and our identity as Jews. The answer is the one to whom that old covenant was meant to point. This is the point about the priests needing to be replaced. Remember he says that the old covenant, the priests, would, they didn't last. Why? For two reasons. One, the obvious one, they died. And two, they had term limits. 25 to 55 was the age of priests. You had 30 years of service as a priest. And you might think term limits are a good thing for some of our, our, our culture today for our elected officials. And the priests, the Old Testament priests, had term limits. The point that the Hebrews writer is making is this. There's a perpetual recy- recycling of the people you depend on to relate to God. They're just human beings. Their service runs out or they drop dead, and you have to have new ones. Josephus estimates that between the time of Aaron and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there were 83 different high priests. The Talmud says over 100. Whatever the case, there's a lot of them, right? It's over and over and over again. The person you depend on to relate to God. And the writer of Hebrews says all that was meant to point you to the one who never ceases, who never stops, whose term doesn't run out whose reign is perfect, who lives forever. You can depend on him. He's the guarantee. Jesus remains forever. Jesus is the better relationship, the better covenant. He himself is how God's people relate to him now. This brings us to the last verse I want to talk about, and I think that it's really the pinnacle of this whole text, verse 25. Consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There are certain verses in the Bible that just seem to capture the whole of the gospel in just a few words. John 3, 16 comes to many of our minds. Romans chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. There's, There's certain verses that just seem to grab it. If you could put verse 25 up there one more time, just again, thanks. I think this is one of those verses. Because, consequently, because of all this talk about Melchizedek and the priesthood and the covenant and the law, which can get us confused. And I can see the way some of you were looking at me a minute ago, huh? Like I looked at Hassel Bullock, right? Here's what it comes down to. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What a verse that is. All, it all comes down to this. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. The word uttermost means completely. He doesn't need your help to accomplish your salvation in any way. What do we mean when you use the term save? Christians say things like, I got saved, or he's saved. Are you saved? What, I, what does that mean? We use it in different ways. You don't save somebody who's doing fairly well but needs a little help to get by. That's not saved. That's advice or aid, right? You don't save somebody who's, you know, partially lost but needs some directions from, you know, their Garmin or GPS is broken and they need, to, you know, they, they need some help getting back on the highway. That's not being saved. You don't save somebody who just, you know, is a little stuck in life. You save someone who's totally lost 
dead and dying, helpless, hopeless, no chance of restoring themselves or finding their way. It, 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 you save, we have nothing to do with our salvation like a blind man doesn't have anything to do with, it, with deciding to see. Or uh, would you trust a blind man to operate on himself or herself for a surgery that would bring back sight to their eyes? It's kind of the point, right? You save someone who cannot, who's dead and dying and lost and hopeless. Jesus is able to, so part of getting the idea of that Jesus is able to save is first getting the idea that we are in desperate need of a Savior. We are totally lost. And I think for many of us, and you might intellectually go, yeah, yeah, I get that, I, I know that. I was once lost, but now I'm found kind of thing. But in our culture, we don't talk about Jesus this way. We talk about him as like, oh, he's a good guy. You, you know, like he's a nice life coach. He's a nice aid to your life. He's, he, you can depend on him and he'll help you and he has great things to say and a good model for life. And that's all tr- well and good and true as far as it goes, but the message here is that Jesus is able to save the uttermost, those who are dead and dying, which is everyone apart from him. The message of Jesus is not, I'm gonna give you some advice. I'm gonna give you some tips to clean up your act. I'm going to coach you into being a better version of you. To quote a pastor who you should not read, the message of Jesus is not your best life now. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you're dead, you're dying, you're lost, you're hopeless, you're helpless, all of us. But Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Why? because he always lives to make intercession. Save to the uttermost is a curious phrase, isn't it? What does that mean? My wife gives me a hard time because when I do the dishes, which I occasionally do, I frequently leave one thing unwashed in the sink. She thinks it's intentionally to drive her crazy. It's not. I often, it's something that's just hard to clean. So I'm letting it soak, you know, <laughs> for however long, right? And she has to come and scrub it out. You know, stuff that gets, just gets stuck on there like it's welded to the side of the pan. Ah, you know? I'll, I'll, do, I'll rinse off the rest and put it in the dishwasher, but that's like, that's like actual work. C- how, could you get that thing actually clean? Clean enough? What does it take to clean it completely? No trace of any contaminant whatsoever. Perfectly restored clean. Is that possible for a human life? My daughter, when she was little, I've told this story before, but it's fun to tell and it illustrates the point. When she was a little toddler, I was no one hand. Benjamin wasn't born yet. My wife was, I think, out shopping and I was in charge of the two. I'm watching football on TV, I think. My son comes into the room, says, Daddy, are you going to spank Hannah? "Mm, Why? (laughs) Are you asking me that? Should I? And I said, why? No, he said, because she's shiny. I don't know what shiny meant, but I was pretty sure it wasn't good. I went to the bottom of the stairs and I saw the top of the stairs a little naked three-year-old girl run by. And in that instant, I thought, something looks shiny about her. <laughs> and I went up there and the carpet in our, uh, it's, we don't have carpet there anymore for this reason, the carpet in our upstairs hallway was slick to the touch. And there was a big giant Sam's Club jar of petroleum jelly empty on the hallway. My daughter came around the corner and said, hi daddy. And it looked like someone had dipped her upside down in a jar of Vaseline, just covered in her hair and hands. And she said, it's squishy. It was coming out of her fingers. And I said, Hannah, and she, you know how kids do when they hear you, dad or mom, is upset. they kind of take your tone. Oh, she went, oh, made a mess, daddy, made a mess. I said, yeah, you made a mess. Took her in the bathtub, gave her like three, washed her hair three or four times with every bit of product I could find on my wife's, you know, all the shampoo and conditioner I could find, trying to get that out. It looked like the Exxon Valdez, had, the oil slick <laughs> in the tub was like up on the sides and oily. And even afterwards, her hair was still stringy. And I was like tell, telling Noah, he's like watching the whole time, you know, see I'm going to spank her. And I said, Noah, don't tell your mother about this, you know. <laughs> the point is, she had made a mess. And she was totally powerless to get herself clean. She, she needed her father, well in this case actually her mother as well, to clean her up. That's a perfect picture of us spiritually. Most of us walk around in the mess we made not even knowing it. And then come to the place 
what the Bible calls repentance. It's come to the place where you recognize I have made a mess and I cannot get clean. I, I can't clean myself. This is what it means when the writer of Hebrews says, consequently, because of all this talk about the priesthood, which was the way God's people tried to relate to God in the past, consequently, because he's a better high priest, because he never runs out, because he's perfect, because he offers perfect sacrifices, because he's gone before you, because you can depend on him. He's the guarantee of a better covenant, a better way to relate to God. Why is that? Because he can save you to the uttermost, perfectly clean you, put you in right standing before God. How do we know this? Because he's still doing it. This always lives to make intercession. It's you, if you trusted in Jesus Christ, you were saved, and you are saved, and he's returning, and you will be saved. It's all one package, right? It doesn't mean you will be saved means you're not saved. You, you were saved the day you trusted him. Sin's forgiven, and you stand now in that salvation. You are being saved in that sense, and someday he will return, which means you will be saved, right? This is the intercession. I, my friend used to say this to me. I've written in my Bible for years. I keep it this way. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure because of my high priest Jesus. I was saved. My past is redeemed. I, I have a life and purpose now. My present makes sense. I'm saved, right? And my future is secure. I will be. That's what we're being told in this one amazing verse. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them, for you, and for me. Last, where we close here, is this. These early Christians that had a Jewish background, the writer identifies as the Hebrews, they're, they're tempted because of life in their world to place their trust in something that used to be familiar to them, an old system they used to find their identity in. And he's urging them, don't go back there. That's not able to save you. Only Jesus is. Don't go back there. Only Jesus is worth trusting and following. I would, I would just ask you, what's that thing, what's that place that your heart is tempted to go back to, to find your sense of identity and security? And hear the word of God say to you, why would you go back there when you have him who's able to save you to the uttermost? Let's bow in prayer. Father God, we acknowledge that your word is true even when we resist it, even when we ignore it, even when we don't fully understand it. We thank you for this ancient story about a mysterious figure called Melchizedek who points our hearts to the one who is to come, your son Jesus Christ, who is the better hope, the better way of relating to you, and the better and only salvation. We thank you for him. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and... Before the benediction and you're dismissed, as always, if you're here this morning and you're in need of prayer, someone to pray for you or to pray with you for any reason, members of the prayer team will be down front. We'd love to meet with you. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of your great high priest, Jesus. To him be glory and honor now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.